happening. But what about the views of the people who have been arguing the case for and against this proposal? We've two of the main proponents with John Bowman. John. And first, uh, some comment from those. Brenton Shorthall of the Pro-Life Amendment campaign and John McMenamin of the Anti-Amendment campaign. Brenton Shorthall, it was your initiative of your group which brought us to this particular referendum. Now, as the votes are counted, it looks like a 2-1 victory, but still only half the electorate turned out. Is this the sort of result that you wanted when you set out in this course? I think the result is very closely uh, in line with what we would have felt ourselves from the canvas returns over the last two or three weeks. Um, in fact, I would myself have possibly ex expected a slight swing against us in the last few days as the uh, the argument about a confused population was developed very strongly. We were, after all, bombarded over the last couple of weeks with the message that we are a confused people. But the result does not bear that out because the turnout, on the one hand, is well up to referendum standards and is, could be considered quite satisfactory in circumstances where the, the, there was not the party political rivalry on the doorsteps bringing out the vote. So are you saying, though, that a confused voter mightn't have listened, say, to the bishops and decided to take their advice because of the, of the confusion and vote yes? Well, if if I could see any in, uh, result from the in intervention of the bishops and their statement, I would say that it probably helped the turnout rather than necessarily helped the proportions because our canvassing returns prior to the bishops' statement did show that uh, the, the same type of three to one situation, a little bit more perhaps in many rural areas, but we do feel that the, inter the intervention of the bishops did stress the importance of the issue and perhaps did help the turnout. But are you disappointed with Oh no, I think the turnout is, is satisfactory in all the circumstances, given the, the incentive there was to people to, to um, in doubt to stay at home. Are you saying that the, the, it's, the, it's the likely to be a 2-1? You take that that's I think that's well probably in. about it, yes. Yep. John McMenamin, do you accept that it's now lost from your side? I accept, John, that we may have lost the referendum, but I think we, lost the, we won the argument. I think that is particularly remarkable that the people where perhaps the, vote, the areas where voters were freest of pressure, that is in the urban centres, seem to have voted fairly resoundingly, except it looks like 50-50, but it looks as if the voters against came out strongly in Dublin. And I, I think that in Dublin we did have a situation where I believe the argument took place more on its merits than in, in some of the rural parts. I think that in that sense we have won a moral victory. I know that moral victories are not great results, but so far as the mandate which Brendan sought from the people is concerned, he didn't get that mandate approximately 35% of the people of all the electorate came out in favour of the amendment. That's not the band that, the, that they were looking for. It seems to me a very weak one. But a lot of people could have stayed away because they, they foresaw this sort of result. They saw it as something close to a landslide and said, why, why bother three miles to, to vote? I accept that, but I think we have to look back, John, at the way the matter was presented originally. The pro-amendment people said that they wanted a resounding mandate. They were looking for ridiculous figures. Obviously, everybody who proposes an idea originally looks for an, a 90% vote or something of that nature. But they didn't get anything like that. I mean, the fact that the Dublin battle is still an issue, that it, it, it looks like a 50-50 result there, Short, is very relevant, point. I think. I'd like to, first of all, make the point, John, that we were not seeking a mandate of any kind. Of course, this is a referendum. We simply thought that the people try the issue. We, our, our proposition that we put forward was that the people should be given an opportunity to express an opinion as to whether or not the Constitution of Ireland should protect unborn human life from its inception. Now, quite clearly, the people have decided overwhelmingly, and we believe wisely, that the Constitution should, should so protect human life. Uh, we were, there is no defeat or victory in this for anybody. We're talking about an idea which we sought to be put before the people and we believe the people have responded carefully and wisely and have seen it as the human rights measure which it is. But what, for instance, of the fact that you could be satisfied with the result but not necessarily with the outcome of your campaign? After all, you, you do have only a third of the electorate going to the polls. You have an element of confusion for, foreboding about from the Attorney General, from the Director of Public Prosecutions, <coughs> from the Taoiseach. All of them saying that this, this may not be the best way to make law. At no stage, John, did we doubt but that this would be a difficult measure to, to proceed with because the issue itself is inherently divisive and each country that, that has had its abortion debate has had divisions of this kind. In the end, we think the dissensions that have arisen in the debate will heal themselves quickly and we would see them as over now. Some people, including mm -hmm. Fergal O'Connor, for instance, the Dominican political scientist, says that what you have done, in fact, is to have normalised the option of abortion and you've brought that before the electorate, made it a normal issue. I think the effect of the debate possibly has to be to bring forward the debate in Ireland a year or two, <coughs> but we would have had sooner or later to have had our, so to speak, abortion debate.
John McMenamin, how do you see the results in terms of the way opinion polls show that there is perhaps an increasing tendency for people to move towards how the younger, uh, urban, educated people are voting and looking at the figures in some of these constituencies where they're better represented? Do you see, in fact, uh, a germ of, of increasing support for the no vote over, over, over the years? Yes, I see more than a, a germ of hope, John. It was quite remarkable. I was in Bolton Street this morning just looking at some of the areas where I think you could identify young votes, Flatland, for example, coming out resoundingly against the amendment. For example, also when we go to the areas where the predominant number of young married couples live in Dublin, South, Dublin South constituency, Dunleary constituency, again we have uh, fairly resounding repudiations of the idea of the amendment. So I think that there is a considerable considerable trend there, which I think Brendan is seeking to ignore. And I, I think, think 50 I, if, 50 if is Brendan, a resounding vote against the amendment. No, no, I'm not, I'm not suggesting for a moment that it is. I'm suggesting that when you have a defeat in the light of the pressures which were brought to bear on the electorate, and they were very considerable pressures from the hierarchy, from other people in positions of authority, when you have those pressures and people come out over 50%, 55%, 60% to reject the amendment, I'm saying that is a very considerable re repudiation of the ideas behind the amendment. Brenton Shorter. Uh, no pressure was stronger than the pressure that suggested that carrying the amendment would kill Irish women. That was by far the strongest pressure that was brought to bear on the electorate, and it is clear that the re electorate overwhelmingly rejected that proposition. What of those who stayed away? Now, normally up to 25, one voter in four doesn't go to the polls anyway, but looking mm. at the other one in four who didn't go, was that an abstention? Was it just laziness? Was it apathy? Was it confusion? Why? Well, I, I What's think your guess? it's impossible, of course, to, to, to figure out what happened to the people who abstained. But I would say that on both sides, there probably was a feeling that the result was a foregone conclusion. After all, we had a poll that showed 70, 30 a few days before election time. Also, I think that the debate was one that was largely carried on in the Dublin media. Uh, I don't think that this electrified the country in the sense that possibly the, the coverage, say, in the national newspapers might have conveyed. Uh, obviously, there were very strong feelings on both sides and, and a very intense debate carried on at a certain level. But I don't think that at any time one could say that, that the country as a whole was worked up about the issue. John McMenamin, would you accept that? I don't agree with what Brendan said for a moment. The situation in some of the rural constituencies were, was quite extraordinary. The extraordinary pressures which were brought to bear on voters actually going into the polling booths to try and suggest for a moment that people weren't worked up in the countryside is absurd. People were intimidated, people had things shouted at them, had abuse shouted at them, even when they were going in and out of the polling booths. And it's, it's quite wrong of Brendan to try and suggest for a moment that there weren't considerable pressures brought to bear on people. Um, there are incredible instances we heard of during the campaign, people being asked in the confession box which way they were going to vote and being asked very, very strongly to vote yes. And this seems to me the, to me the most extraordinary instance of pressurisation. What of that, Brent Shortwell? Intimidation, a climate of intimidation? I mean, after all, the medical profession said that, that there might be? Mm -hmm. Well, intimidation, I think, is a very strong word to use, and it's not a word that I would apply to any particular side in this. But after all, the point I made earlier, that people were told repeatedly, and by the most very authoritative figures, that here was an amendment which, if enacted by the people, would seriously and proximately put the lives of Irish women at risk. Yesterday, in many, at many polling stations, people were confronted by posters mounted by young Fine Gael, which said, vote no to prevent abortion. That was a pressure that was brought upon people also. So that I, I don't think that uh, John McMenamin really is, is relating the true picture there nationally. But on your side also, mm -hmm. you made the point that this was really about abortion. And we would still maintain that, because the effect of the amendment is that uh, if ever abortion is contemplated in Ireland, the people will have to be consulted. That was the objective of the amendment, and that, we believe, is its sole effect. John McMenamin? We think that the result of this amendment totally repudiates the view which Brendan has, has put forward, I think, throughout. And most of the pro-amendment people have put forward throughout the campaign in relation to this argument about whether it's about abortion. If it is about abortion, and we have said consistently that the amendment debate is not about abortion, is he now suggesting that 35% of the electorate have come out in favour of abortion? Obviously not. I think that conclusively proves that the amendment did not concern directly the question of abortion. Brendan Shortall. I think that the fact that the electorate did decide in the proportions that they did in the face of the confusion and the confused picture that was presented to them and their encouragement to be confused is a remarkable indication of clear-sightedness on the part of the electorate. It's clear that at a gut feeling, the electorate realised this was in fact about the prevention of abortion. We